Good afternoon and welcome to the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast. My name is Kayla Bradham and I'm here today with 18-year NBA legend Terry Cummings. Good afternoon, Terry. Thank you. Good afternoon, Kayla. How are you? I am doing great and I'm so happy that you're here with us today. And, you know, being from Milwaukee when you played for the Bucks, that was great. The Clippers, you've played for so many amazing teams. I'm a Golden State Warriors fan because of Steph Curry. Tell us a little bit about your NBA experience, and then I want to go into the real meat of this podcast, which is what you're doing now. Well, I mean, it's uh, 18 years is, uh, is a vast period of time, and the average guy plays three to four, and I got to play about five times in some. So um, I was very fortunate, and, and uh, God was very graceful to me. Uh, I don't know where to start with it. I just can tell you that it was greater than I ever anticipated it being. Uh, I'd always played in the Chicago area um, through high school and college against some of the best players to never play on a basketball court on TV. Uh, and, and I think it all prepared me for it because the chip I played with on my shoulder came from playing against cats who respected you but didn't overly respect you on the street level. And then bringing that into the NBA uh, conversation, uh, a, a lot of the guys that I played against were guys that grew up on that same street level, but it kind of gotten away from the atmosphere uh, that the street level b ballers brought. And it was a, a no respect, you know, when you get on the court, it's, uh, and if I were to say one thing about my NBA career, it was, we can be friends off the court. But when we're on the court, we don't have friends. And that, that is something that is, is a law, almost an unwritten law on the street level. And it used to be on the NBA level. But uh, today's NBA, is uh, they're a lot more friendly than I probably ever would have been. That's amazing how, you know, growing up in Chicago, I teach high school language arts in Milwaukee. And so many of my students say, Miss B, yeah, I want to play in the NBA or I want to play in the NFL. What steps got you into the NBA? Like that's obviously sheer raw talent, but what else? Well, I don't even know that it was sheer raw, raw talent, Kayla. I think that uh, for me, I went from the average kid uh, my freshman year, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, over my freshman to my sophomore year, I grew about eight or nine inches over that summer. And then I came back to school at 6'4". And averaged out two or three inches a year to my senior year. I got to six nine, but I, six four just gangly. Uh, but I was always a bit agile because I was a roller skater uh, during the summer, ice skates during the winter, playing hockey uh, during the summer and winter, and all the sports I could play from um, track and field, long jump, uh, high jump, sprints. You know, eight eighty, uh, four forty relays, all the different things that because all these things were offered to us on a public level in the inner city. And so we, we took advantage of all of it. But I think more than anything, it was my, my drive was that the anger that I had birth, been birthed with, you know, coming up in the inner city, I could never explain to people why I had this anger. But as I matured and uh, became, you know, a Christian at 16, I believe that I made a conscious effort to divert my anger towards something other than being angry. And so I took it and diverted it toward basketball and I got real dedicated discipline. And um, I had people around me, Coach Horace Howard at Carver High School and um, people, uh, Mr. Bailey, uh, we called him Mr. B. Uh, these were the cats that took us around the city and, and got us acclimated to, to life on the on the real side and made me more responsible because i think some of the greatest uh things that a ball player should have are ancillary to him or her and that is you know uh being able to decipher uh through your own maturity uh how to handle things you know and and not to blow things out of proportion not to stress yourself not to even live vicariously or uh, let your parents live vicariously through you make it your dream your life you know and fortunately for me, my mom and father and, uh, and dad, um, mom had about a, um, a eighth grade, maybe a high school education, and dad didn't even have an eighth grade education, but they, they were two of the most intelligent people I have known to this day. And they had some of the greatest wisdom. Uh, they allowed me to make my own choices and decisions as a young man. And, and invariably I have done the same for my sons. 
You know, I wanted them to grow up and be their own men. They, they'd never be able to say, well, dad, or they, my sons call me pop. They'll never be able to say, pop, you know, uh, you made this choice for me and didn't work out. No, I gave you all the information you need. I prepared you for this day. Now you have to make your own decision because you have to live by it, you know? So. Yeah, Terry, you said something really great, and it was about diverting your anger. And living in Milwaukee, you being in Chicago, I, I see so much of that anger and animosity and victim mentality, and it's not my fault. It's la da 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 da. Yeah. What What is your message to young kids with all of that anger? And I guess it's not even the young kids because it carries over into adulthood, doesn't it? Absolutely. And some people who are um, seniors in that in that in that perspective. But I, I think it's cross-cultural and it's not a black or white issue. It's something that has to do with generationals, uh, the generations of our peoples. Um, and I think that it is also massively uh, intuitive for them because of what media is saying and, and all of their friends collectively, their peers and all that. I think I, I remember with my youngest son, Sean, he would always say, I'm a man. He would always say that I'm a man. And I, I you know, I'm grown now. Woo, woo, woo. And I told him, I said, no, because he was uh, still in high school and he was feeling himself. And I told him, I said, no, you're not grown. I said, you're grown when you can accept responsibility for the things you do wrong and say, I'm sorry and move and grow up uh, until you can do that. You are still a little boy. You know, you got the body of a man, but you don't have the mind and the heart of one. And that takes growing up. That takes accepting responsibility for the things that you have done around you that are that are not working out right or that don't work at all. You know, I think that's a tendency of, of I think maybe one of the greatest things that I have learned from watching uh, these different generations is there's no longer a great uh, desire or a great uh, value placed on matur maturation. Uh, the, the, there's a great divide there because society has taught our children, no matter what we taught them in the house, society has taught them they could be whoever they want to be and do whatever they want to do. And that's true. But the thing is, society didn't teach them what we as parents should and, and did, which is there is a cost for everything you choose to do. Yes. And, and that, that cost has to be accepted for you to grow up. And if you don't accept the cost, you tend to be very immature in the one area where you need to be the most mature. And that's in the, the choice of knowing that, you know, asking forgiveness or saying I'm sorry is not a weakness. It's a strength. It's something that most people lack, no matter what age or culture they're from. They lack the ability to say I'm sorry and then to move into a place of doing something to to change that moment or to change themselves in that moment. Terry, speaking of change, you said that uh, you you changed your life with the decision you made at 16. NBA Rookie of the Year, 18-year NBA veteran. After retirement, you become an ordained minister. No, actually, actually, Go ahead. I, actually, I was called, I was in ministry at 16. I've been preaching now and in ministry over 43 years. So through high school, through college, through 18 years in the league, and then through these last 21 years of retirement. And I pastor uh, a church in the Atlanta area in Stone Mountain, Georgia right now, uh, 13 years. Uh, so it's um, it's been very unique for me because I think that it coincided, uh, the call of God to ministry coincided with my heart mind for basketball because prior to then I couldn't choose uh, correctly because I was my first sport was hockey and then I started playing baseball and then uh, the year I grew I just grew out of baseball and hockey and all I could do was just kind of migrate toward basketball I couldn't fit the skates anymore you know and um, baseball you know was was just a different sport for me I love playing it but I, I I had a different level of appreciation and admiration for basketball and most of it was because of my older brother um, so I hope I answered that question. I, I, I just, um, I don't, um, I have a, just man, a, a natural affinity toward, um, wanting to, to do things that don't just benefit myself, but that benefit all the people around me that I believe I am supposed to inspire. 
I don't believe I'm supposed to inspire the world or everybody in it. I believe that there are certain people God gives me, and I've learned as I've gotten older that that group is some are, are a group of people that hear me and see me. Everybody doesn't hear you, and everybody doesn't see you. And the ones that do get the greatest benefits of you being in their environment, the ones that don't will get nothing out of it. But the ones that don't tend to be the ones that will, will take the most of your time because uh, they don't get you because they don't see you and they don't hear you. They don't get you. The ones that see you and, and, and hear you, they get what you're saying and they watch what you're doing and they, um, they, they toward, they, they tend to, uh, acclimate their activities toward it if if it's something they want to do and they get it quicker the the other people that don't get you and don't hear you they never get you and they never hear you so they never get any of the benefits but they pull stuff from you that belongs to other people and so i've learned to monitor how how i give out things and how i share the experiences uh, based on how people take even the, the rudimental uh, values of, of information that I give to them. If they don't take to those things over a period of time, I realize that, that there's an impediment there. There's something there that hinders it. You know, I, I think that's so great. And it just makes me think about something that you said before the show. And it was let the work speak for you. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are all about uh, reaching out use it, you know, creating hope and possibility in your community and, and you're doing it and you're not seeking fame or glory for what you're doing, but I am going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask you to share with our listeners some of the things that you are doing currently. Um, pastoring, uh, 13 years, Hope E. Genito Ministries, uh, international, uh, music projects because music has been a love of mine. I've been in entertainment since 84, 85. My companies are um, over 35 years old, publishing company, entertainment companies, uh, and my newest uh, acquisition or or business is uh, called um, Virtual uh, Interactive, and it is a sports news and entertainment uh, hybrid of a cable and um, a streaming network television 24-7 that is viewed in 17 countries right now. So it's um, taking up quite a bit of uh, my early day uh, every day, but I've gotten acclimated to getting back to that semblance of being in an office, although I'm at home working. Um, but those things keep me, and I'm really excited about it because there's a piece of it. Um, you're in the Milwaukee area, right? I am. There's a piece of uh, virtual um, that we're connected to that is in the Milwaukee area called Gap. And I don't know if you're familiar with them, Generations Against Bullying. I think that I am. And actually, is that a program that the NFL Gilbert Brown is part of? I didn't hear you. Yeah, that's okay. I know it cut out. I said, I believe that that is a program I'm familiar with. And am I right that that's a part of the program that NFL former Green Bay Packer Gilbert Brown promotes? It may be. Um, it is a program that's over 20 years old in the Milwaukee area. So it could be because Gilbert uh, Gilbert played a while. I think he might have played while I was there in, uh, in the Milwaukee area, too. Um, so. But uh, but I, it may be. But what I, I love about it is the whole concept of not, you know, not accepting bullying as a, a part of our lives, even though we'll par probably always have some of it uh, in our life because of insecurities in people. You know, bullying is not about being the biggest and strongest and smartest person It's normally about being the most insecure in, in, um and it comes out by bullying. You know, so we we are. Um, largely that is the at the core of everything and i always think that you it, to be truly successful at anything you set out to do it has to be more than about money you know money should not be the primary thing if you've got a good enough tool or a product or something then the product will speak for itself just like we were talking earlier about everything else you do but meanwhile you need to have a concept um, that you're pushing or pulling toward that drives uh, all that you're doing. And then for us, it's the bullying piece because it's really important. Everybody has 
on some level probably uh, felt it. That's a that's a great point. I value that. I appreciate that. I see that in the school systems and, you know, in the world we live in. Honestly, we know what happens at work. It, it really does carry over yeah, to everywhere, just about every place. Yeah. Insecure people, hurting people, hurt people. Right. Absolutely. So that, that kind of leads us in, Terry, to family and leadership. And, and I know raising three sons, you've picked up some wisdom along the way. What message would you share with our listeners, you know, towards being a, a good godly husband, a good parent? What What is your message? Well, from the parental perspective, there's a proverb that says, train up a child in the way that he or she should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. I think that so many of us have taken on the perspective of reading and not really understanding. I remember reading an article and it says that in today's society, more people are reading than ever before in the history of the world. But then he sidebars and says, but they understand less. You know, they're reading more, but understand less. And the reason for it is because to, to understand it is the untypical in, in our society uh, means by which you have to give yourself to the dedication of studying, pondering, meditating, and, and drilling yourself on it until you get it or get the meaning in, in my work, my realm, the, the God inspired meaning, you know? So I, I think um, it's uh, the training part is to train them up in the way that they should go find out where their hearts are as children. And we as parents are to, supposed to, drive them toward it because we have experience they don't have. We have lived this life longer than them and we know the roads that lie ahead of them. So when we see certain attribute, attributes in our children, our role should be to push them toward that. Historically, that's not true because historically, if I was a, uh, if I, if an insurance salesman or if I worked at the hardware store, or if I worked in corporate America, I expected my sons to do the same. But with me, I did the total opposite with my sons. I did not teach my sons basketball till they came to me and begged me to because it was what they wanted. Because I needed to know that they weren't doing it because their father was doing it. And I wanted them to be productive in their lives doing what they wanted to do. You know, and I think ultimately it's one of the greatest things I can uh, share. I went around the corner with it, but I'm coming home now. That's okay, <laughs> it's, I love it's, it, go. Yeah, the, the greatest things I can share is you know, give your children the opportunity to be who they're supposed to be absent, you know, living, you living vicariously through them. I mean, that is one of the greatest lessons we can. I mean, I've been around sports and entertainment, music, movies, and all of that stuff. And it is terrible to see what some of our, us as parents do to our children, just because we want, we, we were not as successful as we wanted to be. So we're living our lives through them forcing them into uncomfortable situations and, you know, pitting them against people that they like, you know, and people who by far probably could be of greater help to them down the road, you know, but that's. I, I think that's an amazing message. And it seems like, you know, from, from the things you say, they're things that people can really take to heart. We had a comment come up from Brandon Frayne saying, everyone has their own dreams, but the lessons help. And I think that that's a great message. So I'm going to ask you as far as, you know, marriage goes, what are some of the lessons that you've gleaned over? How many years have you been married? Well, I'm not married now. I was married at 19 and uh, divorced at about 34, 35. Perfect. So, then you have a message. You know, <laughs> you know what, yeah. what is the message? Uh, well, you know, the thing is, is if you can fix it, fix it, because there's there's nothing. And this is not a, a negative or a positive. It's just the truth. If I had had it to do again, I probably never would have divorced because the things that I um, we were divorced over looking back now at this mature place that I live in and stand in. Uh, it was it was just stupid. I mean, it, it was ignorant of me. And, and I mean, because I didn't have the knowledge I have now. Um, and it was just, you know, I think most of us, if we look back at it, and it may not be true of everybody, because I know some people who are very absolute about <laughs> what they had done in divorcing or separating. 
and um, there may be some that that is required. But I think for the most part, if you if you go into your relationship with the mindset that no matter what happens, we're going to stay together, we're going to find a way to work it out, then your relationship will always work out. If you go in and I was I'll use my own example, my oldest son and sharing with him. Uh, and he was going into counseling and um, he felt like it was not going to be good for him. And I, and I explained to him that if you go in there thinking negatively, uh, then whatever you hear, no matter how positive it is, will come to you through a negative filter. I said, what you have to do is go in there knowing ahead of time. I'm not going in here to divorce my wife. I'm not going in here to destroy my marriage. I'm going in here to make me better so that I can be better for my marriage and my wife. Cause I think that where most people, you know, I've been counseling and advising people over 40 years on so many levels, but most people fail because they, they literally go in thinking that this is it and they don't have a plan. And, and I was one of those too. Cause when I got divorced, I, I, you know, I thought I had a grip on who I would become and who I would be. But the circumstances of life were vastly different. I was still playing in the NBA. Um, I would play eight years more after my divorce. I would experience things I'd never experienced before because I had never been single. And I, the first time I was single, I, I was like 34, 35 years old. And there's a lot of things that I was not used to because I'd been married all my life. You know, and I had to contend with uh, my flesh, I had to contend with my my thoughts and, and the way I thought, the way I saw things. I had to deal with my anger again that I hadn't had, you know, since I was 16. I was dealing with it 20 years later. And it was an anger that came from being dislocated or discombobulated from that, that soulmate of yours that you had, that you were connected to. You had so much in common. And somewhere along the line, it was uh, separated. But I will say this in closing on that. Uh, whenever you have two people in a relationship, it's never one person's fault more than the other. It's both of them are at fault. And if that is not realized, you can't fix it. They both have to accept responsibility for their part and they have to be able to confess it, not just to God, but to one another, because they're not just in relationship with God. The wedding vows are not just to God, but to that man and that woman. They make that commitment to one another. And uh, when you make that commitment, you know, you want to live up to it because as long as you set your mind to do so, you can always reverse anything in a relationship because as you grow, you're going to find out that most of the stuff you're fussing about is petty and it doesn't have any, you know, any grounds for you to be setting up fussing on. But in the moment of emotion, it seems bigger than it is. Great advice, Terry. And let's speak about the moment of emotion. Uh, you said earlier on the show that when you're on the court, nobody's your friend. Right. It's all basketball. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to just ask you out of curiosity, could you tell us your favorite team to play for? Um, Milwaukee was definitely um, at the top of my list because uh, Milwaukee saved me from uh, – being in, in the uh, Clipperville too much longer than I was. I spent two years with the San Diego Clippers and the year the Clippers moved to LA, um, I was traded uh, during that training camp to Milwaukee and played for them for the next five years. But some of my greatest experiences uh, on and off the court are in Milwaukee, you know, playing for Don Nelson, um, watching my kids grow up. My, my youngest boy was born in Milwaukee. You know, so it was uh, Milwaukee and San Antonio. I love playing it. I did not like it when I got traded to them. I thought it was a hick town and got there, found out it, they had a metropolis and they had a thriving city that was going on. And um, and it was one of the first cities I lived in where, you know, culturally Hispanics were the majority. And it was like learning a whole nother culture to the point we, we started calling it Little Mexico. You know, um, but I enjoyed it. And then when I finally left San Antonio, I know you only asked me which one team, but I think I had two careers. I had the first 10, 12 years where, you know, I played and I was the man. And then I had the next six to eight years, depending on how you look at it, 
where I was, I played the best basketball in my life. And I was a role player coming off the bench. And I had so much fun as the leader and not having to have that responsibility to go out and get 20 plus and nine or 10 boards every game, but just to fit in and encourage cats. Cause you know, being the star on the team, you know what it's like to start. And you know what the requirement is when the starters go to the bench because we needed it as starters. So we always, you know, first thing is maintain the lead that was given to you before the starters went to the bench. As we got better, it was to make sure that when the starters came off the bench, we had handed them back what they gave us plus more. That's awesome. T tell me about your favorite coach. Don Nelson. Nice Don, choice. <laughs> yeah, Don Nelson was uh, on the pro level, and and it's neck and neck with him and Larry Brown. My my first coach was Paul Silas, and Paul was really uh, uh, great for me in San Diego because I was coming from college and I was under a lot of uh, um, stress and stuff. But he made things easier for me, explained things, talked things out. Then I got to uh, Milwaukee. Coach uh, Nelson was actually one of the first coaches I'd ever played for that uh, first he, he just came out and told me what he wanted from me, what he needed me to do. And that made, and all I had to do was focus on what he had said. And um, the only other coach that kind of came close was Larry Brown, you know, just because uh, I think there's something to be said about understanding how to conform to what is already in place and putting who you are in that mix and, and making it, you know, making yourself a part of it and it a part of you. So Milwaukee was already a solid team, Sidney Moncrief, you know, Randy Brewer, Paul, Paul Pressey, uh, and um, a lot of other guys. And then when I came there, I came with Ricky Pierce and Craig Hodges, who I'd been playing with in San Diego. And so we came in and blended right away. I mean, our, our team came in and, you know, pretty much kicked butt for about five years while I was there. So um, those those were my favorite uh, as far as they taught me how to play NBA basketball. And Terry, I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask you to forgive me, but I'm just curious. You said that you grew up in inner city Chicago and I think you went to DePaul, right, for college? Right. Mm -hmm. Would would you have been able to go to college if it wasn't for basketball? Um, I would have been able to go to maybe a community college where the tuition was paid. Uh, my family was poor. We we didn't have money for college, and I would have had to go and work. You know, like the typical common student uh, uh, to get into college. I didn't even know that I could go to college, to be honest. And it was not like everybody above me. Uh, there's 13 kids in the family count me seven seven boys six girls um so it wasn't like everybody above me went to college i mean it wasn't like a, a no-brainer you know like it is today you know kids know they can go to college whether it's a division one or you know ivy league black or uh traditionally black college i mean they 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 believe they can go and they are entitled, but they're entitled because of all those people that came before them that set the stage. And so that's often missed in this melee of, of information and all of this knowledge that they so-called have, uh, these younger generations. And it's not a negative thing. You know, you will always feel entitled when it's something given to you that you did not earn. It's hard for you not to. So I have to ask you, you know, teaching in a Milwaukee choice school, um, just honestly, I, I do see some kids who are just like, you know, I, I just don't think, I think it's a burden. I don't want to be a burden. I'm, I'm afraid of being in debt. I don't know if there's any hope or opportunity for higher education. Maybe I'll just go work in a factory. What's the message that you would impart to young people as far as getting that education and, you know, finding a way to make things work or make life work. Do you I have think, advice? Yeah, I think it works better if you want to be educated towards something that is a benefit to who you believe your purpose and destiny lies in. I mean, if you go to school and you're studying to be a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer or something, but that's not where your mind and your heart is. You're not going to be as productive. You may do it and you may make great money doing it, but you will never be satisfied and at peace in your heart about who you are. So you need to distinguish 
sooner rather than later. Um, and a lot of this is easy. I'm going to make it biblical. There's a, a um, scripture in um, Jeremiah 29 and 11, and it says about God um, talking to uh, Israel or the people of God. And he says, I know the thoughts and that word thought is interpreted plans. I know the plans I have concerning you, plans to bless you and not to curse you and to give you an expected end, which is a hope, you know. And so um, I believe that if you are to find out the plans for your future, your mother and daddy may not be the best people to go to. But because God knows you should have some form of, of life communication with him where he can direct or redirect you. And that word no in the Greek means yada. Y-A-D-A. -A. And yada means to know with an intimacy that is greater than the physical form of intercourse. God knows us in a way that we don't even know ourselves. And um, I think that you have to situate yourself in such a way that you start to, you know, at 16, I started asking those questions. What's my purpose? You're never too young. You know, what am I destined to do in this world? And I know I was not destined to be a basketball player. And when I say destined, I mean, that's not the end of who I am. The end is something more. And each and every one of us have to see it that way because plans can be drawn up by men and women every day to do things, but it's the plan of God that's gonna be successful because most people think in terms of spiritual church and stuff like that, but it's more, it's all the activities that go into it and, and, and are a part of it from schooling to relational things, you know, being a mother, being a father, being a son, being a daughter, working at the bank, you know, and many of us, we didn't just get here. You know, I've, I've done toilets, cleaned out toilets. I've had to sweep floors. I've had to carry other people's things to the cars. I had to wash their cars. I had to learn to serve to get to that place because it, it's in the humility of, of who we have, we learn ourselves to be or come to understand it is in that humility that we get exalted. And that means we grow and we grow in the knowledge of who we are. We grow in the knowledge of what we do when we don't place what we do above who we are. So when you when you start to understand who you are, you're getting to the point where you'll also start to understand the plan for your life. Yeah. And, you know, we said earlier, God first, do what you do in private. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you're involved in some food programs, um, very, very quietly doing some nice things, have some nice business ventures. I guess I, I want to just give you a moment to shout out the people that you need to say thank you to or who've really touched your life. Well, we talked about them um, during the course of this, you know, Co Coach Horace Howard, um, at Carver High School, Mr. Bailey also playing uh, with him and some of the guys I grew up with in Augill Gardens. Uh, then Ray Meyer at DePaul, Joey Meyer. I mean, people who really helped influence my life. Paul Silas, uh, Don Nelson, Larry Brown, um, and, and on and on. Uh, G Gary St. Jean, you'll remember him from the Milwaukee Buck teams, I think. Um, but, you know, above all, God, you know, my Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, again, not to be religious because I'm not a religious person. I'm relational. You know, I have a relationship with Christ. And, um, you know, underneath uh, my relationship with Christ is my mom and dad. I mean, they taught me the best parts of them. And those are the parts I retain. Uh, so that I could be a better person. I'm not perfect. That's not what I'm saying. But in the Greek, the word perfect implies more maturation than it does perfection, you know? And in that sense, I've grown. I've grown up because of all these people and more. I mean, the people, my mother died um, when I was 40. My dad died when I was 25. You know, I'm knocking at the door. My next birthday, I turned 60. And everywhere along that path, God has provided people for me who influenced me in the ways that my mom and dad could have or would have if they had been here. So I, I think I don't take anything for granted. I think that every opportunity, every step we take is ordered by God, whether we know him or not, he has a play in it. And so we have to learn to talk to him and listen when he speaks, however he speaks to you. 
And Terry, we are just about out of time. I want to remind our listeners they're listening to Legacy After the Locker Room with today's guest, 18-year NBA veteran Terry Cummings, ordained minister. Terry, I do ask every guest to partner with me for the Special Olympics cause. Uh, I think it's a very important charity that's doing good work to help athletes. And I know that you've uh, actually dedicated one of your one of your professional years to that cause yourself. Are you willing to make an autograph donation for us to Special Olympics, Terry? I sure am, Kayla. That's no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Can Can I ask? Do you mind telling us real briefly about about how, what you you said every year? You picked a different charity and gave to in your professional career. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I not you- only gave to, but I served with them in the, at their functions. Uh, the I was with the Texas uh, Special Olympics when I was playing for uh, San Antonio and as a sponsor and as figurehead. And so whenever they would do events, I would come out to support when I could. Um, and, but I, I've also done the Sam Shelter in San Antonio, uh, in Milwaukee, I actually worked with the Sojourner Truth House, which was a home for battered women. Um, I was a spokesperson for them. And I've worked with uh, St. PJ's in San Antonio as a home for boys. Uh, I think boys and girls, but I know boys for sure. But I've always chosen one charity that I could and when I could uh, to support. But now, you know, pastoring is like a 24-7 and it's not a charity, but it's the place where I put my time and effort to build other people up and to strengthen them. You know, we often talk about it in the church and um, they say, you know, you could be doing a whole lot of other things other than what you're doing right now. I say, yeah, I could, but if I were doing those things, I wouldn't be doing the right things, you know? So the, the right thing is always to do what you know in your heart, you are called to do and you feel that unction on the inside and you move that way. Everything works out. That is great advice. I, I'm good. You know, I if I could sum up, summarize this podcast in one sentence, I think you out of the nearly 30 guests we've had on the show just nailed it. Just do the right thing and do what God called you to do. Do it humbly, do it quietly and just do it. That's right. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for imparting that wisdom. Terry, if people want to follow you, you I, I did have a comment come up saying I'd love to be able to speak to Terry. If people want to follow you, how can they follow you on social media? Well, I'm at Facebook under my name, Terry Cummings. I'm also there under Hope Egenito Ministries, Inc. Uh, that's another one of our pages for the church. Uh, and then my business is Cummings Entertainment Group. There's a page up there, Facebook for that. Um, there's also TikTok is the Terry Cummings. You can find me there. Instagram is, um, I think it's, uh, Terry Cummings as well. I got, I got to tell you, I reposted your TikTok on my Facebook page with the, uh, from, from the Clippers to the businessman, to the minister. It's one of the best TikTok videos I, I've seen. I, in fact, I showed my 16 year old son that TikTok video and he's like, Mom, I know Terry Cummings. That's cool. He's an awesome guy. <laughs> so, so thank you for, you know, being such a legend that 16-year-olds know who you are. That's so cool. I, I thought that was so that. fabulous. I appreciate Absolutely. It. Absolutely. Terry, we are out of time. I want to give you about a minute and a half to um, go ahead with parting words of wisdom that create hope and possibility. Well, there's there's a, a, a scripture that Solomon, the uh, King Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes at the end about the 12th chapter. After he had accumulated all this information and knowledge he shared in the first 11 chapters, he came down to the end, which is where I think all of us do before we make those choices at the crossroad to move left or right or straight ahead. He said that um, here is the conclusion of the whole matter to fear God and to keep his word. Everything else will take its course and do what it's supposed to do. But fearing God does not mean, you know, like we are afraid of man, but it means to be in awe of God and to keep his word as much as in us is is, um, in our our ability to do. So that, that would be my end, the conclusion of the whole matter. I love it. Terry, once again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. 
I appreciate taking your time out of your weekend to come on and to really join me in creating hope and possibility through sports with what you're doing for the kingdom of God. I'm so grateful for that. My name is Kayla Brad. I'm here with Apostle Terry Cummings, 18-year NBA veteran, reminding you to live your legacy. Thank you, Terry. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kayla.